So I wanted to talk a little bit about Go and why I'm really excited about it and why I think it's going to be the next big thing and how it already kind of is, um, like how, you, how Java used to be like a really big thing in the early 2000s. Um, there's kind of like this big shift in, you know, I don't know, maybe C++ was big and then we went to Java. Now we went to JavaScript and now we're going to Go. I think, you know, it's going to be a big uh, shift in, in how we write software, which is really exciting. And the thing is, um, considering programming paradigms, is that, of course, there's object-oriented and then there's like procedural, generally speaking, you know, imperative procedural. Um, so things historically are cyclical. Um, if you talk to anyone that's been around for several decades um longer than me like my boss is in his 50s he's been working as a software engineer for like 30 or 40 years or something and like i go to him and i say hey there's this new framework the way we build like angular applications i go to him and say hey there's this cool new framework where it's very hypermedia oriented and server oriented and he's like wait we've been doing that for for years or we used to do that now we're more client oriented but like it's it's a shift so now there's htmx or whatever and it's like this new trend but that was how we began and and then like early 2010s there was like react and angular and then now we're shifting back so it went from very server how it started like simple html pages and then like maybe php or whatever on the server um and then you know very heavy JavaScript, Angular, starting with Angular, and then React, and then Vue, and then, but now we're going kind of maybe back to another shift towards the server. But the whole, the whole point is that things are cyclical. So that's the, then what else is cyclical? You could say possibly programming paradigms also are cyclical in that every language currently is object-oriented. If you consider like the top four are Python, JavaScript, C sharp and Java, like those four languages are the same. Like if you look at, if you learn one, you learn all. Like they all have the same, I mean, they have the same like filter, reduce, whatever array methods, they all kind of copy one another, but they also share the same uh, object oriented patterns. So those four languages that I mentioned are all kind of the same. Like. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but they all are very similar in the way that they, they have object-oriented programming and classes and so on. And so before all that, before you could say like C++ was the first big object-oriented language, um, right, C with classes, C++. Um, before that, you just had like C, which was very procedural, and a lot of other languages were probably either procedural or functional. Um, so we went from the beginning, which was very procedural and like simple and minimal, what we consider it now to be. And then it went like small talk was the first object oriented language, but C++ was the first pot, like it first popularized it in industry. Um, and then a bunch of other languages followed suit with Java, C sharp and so on. But now it's like, maybe we're seeing a shift back to procedural with Go because the same authors, the creators of C, um, like Ken Thompson, um, Brian Kerningham, and Rob Pike, like all of those original Unix programmers in the 70s who created C are now uh, working on Go, or they have been for the past like decade and a half. Like I think it was conceived in 2007, then it was open source in 2009. First release, I believe in 2012. And then now it's being increased usage and adoption and it's maybe comparable to like java in early 2000s with its popularity and usage so on the topic of performance i believe go is comparable to c sharp and java pretty much they're kind of the same like there's benchmarks that say one is faster than the other or um, you run this certain algorithm and the other is faster than the other and it's like i don't think it's really worth comparing um, at that point so it's very comparable to Java and C Sharp in terms, in terms of performance. I believe it's about 10 times faster than Python and a lot of benchmarks that they ran. Um, but I don't know, performance like isn't really uh, the whole point. Uh, the whole point of Go, Go is that 
it's a procedural language, so it's it rejects the object-oriented paradigm, like object-oriented being a problem-solving methodology that subsequently is then how you organize your code, right? So instead of solving the problem directly, um, step by step in whatever way, you would first identify the objects, their attributes, their methods or actions that those objects have. So it's just a problem solving methodology. It's just one approach to solving problems and thus how you'd organize your code. But uh, so instead it's procedural, it's very simple and minimal, just like C. And it's basically the C of the 21st century, so to speak. Um, again, written by the same authors um, as C in the 70s. So considering those four main languages, C Sharp, Java, Python, and JavaScript, um, they're very similar, they're very object-oriented, but if you look at a talk by Rob Pike, um, the, one of the creators of Go, he mentions that he goes to these programming language talks like JavaScript, C-sharp, he goes to um, conferences, and he mentioned that all the lang languages, they actually copy features from one another. So they're very similar, and there's a reason for that. Um, so they, why do they copy features from one another? Um, maybe because it's like, oh, Python has a, a filter and a reduce now. Now JavaScript needs that too to, to compete or something like that. Um, you know, if, like, if we don't have these features, then we're going to lose market share and we're going to not have as many people using our language. Um, that's possibly the, the logic behind it. But either way, um, if they're then increasing features and so one language gets a new feature, oh, we really like that. Now all those three other languages are going to adopt the same one. That means they're growing in complexity um, while simultaneously becoming more similar to one another. And that is bloat without distinction, in the words of Rob Pike, which I really like. Um, so Go is an unapologetic, boring language with an intended lack of features. That's what I like the most. Um, and what that means is uh, it is not expressive or it's minimally expressive. Like there is many languages like TypeScript, like I deal with a TypeScript code base in my internship, which is a very expressive language. Um, there's a lot of ways to like write some code that does the exact same thing. Um, and what that means is you can get very clever and have like these one liners that do something that could have been six or seven lines. Um, and that's very nice for the person writing it, but not very nice for the person reviewing and like refactoring the code um, like a year later or something or several years later when the language changed and now like some features are um, I don't know, maybe like deprecated or maybe there's like a new way that we do this pattern because there's features change. Um, so with Go, it the whole point is let's have as little features as possible and keep things as simple as possible so that like you could have some guy wrote, write an entire code base and like five years later um, refactoring it is like easy. Um, and there's also um, the whole thing about reading a file t uh, top to bottom. So often in ob object oriented, um, you're tracing methods and tracing uh, where things came from like control click and that makes it pretty easy to do that. Um, but I don't like tracing files. Like if I have to see where a method uh, and was inherited from, and then this method um, also contains a variable which was imported from another file, um, and then another file subsequently. Like it's just a lot of tracing back and forth. Like I'd rather just have one file that I know what's going on top to bottom, and I think that's an important point of go as well. So from some of my previous writing, which I believe was from uh, this came straight from like a research paper of that biscuit OS like this um, operating system written in Go. Go, um, But there's like four points. Um, so there's four problems with C, because again, Go is just kind of an extension of, of C, you can think of it um, at a service level being very similar to C. Um, under the hood, it's like way different, and there's like a garbage collector and all these different things. But on a service level, it's very similar to C. And we can see four main things that are addressed. Um, and kind of solved with high level language features being one uninitialized variables two out of bounds so in other words if you have an array um with like indices zero one two three four 
Um, but then you try to access a point at indice like six or seven that's out of bounds, um, and that would cause like some kind of error in C. But there's bounds checking in Go, which solves that issue. Um, and then three use after free. So like in C, you would uh, like malloc and then free. So memory allocate, um, you know, x number of bytes and then free it afterwards. Um, that's like very low level, like close to the hardware managing of memory, which obviously you don't have to think about that at all with the garbage collector um, going on with pretty much any language has that nowadays. But um, read or write to unintended object, memory safety bug, I'll have to figure out what that means. Um, finally, number four is prevented without the use of pointer arithmetic. So pointer arithmetic, I don't even think they recommend that in C++ now, like they have like smart pointers and like, I don't even know what they're doing in that world, but I don't think pointer arithmetic has been relevant for like a long time. So although there is no pointer arithmetic, um, pointers are allowed and encouraged in Go. Now this of course reminds me it with this bounds checking and like these high level language features that make your, the life of the programmer easier um, with like garbage collector, bounds checking, um, like all those things are nice um, and they improve productivity at the cost of like CPU performance, like there's, it has to do all this stuff for you. So therefore it's gonna be a little bit worse at performance. Um, so if you wanted to actually prevent the bounds checking, um, you can actually like dig into the x86 assembly and kind of prevent these high level language features yourself. Say if you were like building a game engine and you wanted to like squeeze out as much performance as possible. Um, but that's a whole nother topic for like another video. And that was really a video that I saw of another guy who was comparing Rust to Go. He wrote a game engine and like Go and then was comparing something out. Maybe I'll link it, but either way. Um, mm. So if you're interested in Go, Go and actually want to learn it, um, you can kind of either, there's two paths, I guess, or two options. Like either one, you like know a language or two, like, Python, JavaScript, C Sharp, doesn't matter. Um, if you've like known other languages, like it's not that hard, it's very simple and you don't need to learn anything. Like it's just, you start writing in it and read the documentation and Google stuff until you um, get a hang of it. Um, in the case that like you are very inexperienced and kind of like a beginner, then I would highly recommend uh, this book right here. I think I just printed out a PDF, um, but it was, it's written by uh, Brian W. Kerningham, which he was an original Unix programmer in the 1970s who was the author of the C programming language book, the original one. Um, and I highly recommend that. I'll link that um, as far as just a free PDF online, a kind of a book you can read. Um, but as far as what I did, I was just like, I was just kind of dinking around and wanted to make like a game. I just make like ter terminal based games. So this is maybe something I'll show off. One of the things I really like about Go is that structs make it very easy to organize just, just records, you know, like little bits of data. You make a template of like what you want an attack to look like. If you have like, if you're building like a Pokemon game or something, you have like an attack, you have a Pokemon itself and an att a given attack would have a name, which is a string, damage, which is an integer, attack type, which is, you could make that a string as well. And like in Python, I don't really know how you'd go about like making a simple template. Like, yeah, I know there's classes, but like that seems overly complex just to make something like a very simple template or, or uh, I don't know, a collection of data members, right? Um, I don't really like that. And I kind of like the whole struct. Um, um, concept, which again goes back to C. Um, it's very, very similar to C. If you've read C, um, Go is like sometimes almost the same. So as far as loops, um, there really is no while loop. Um, there's just four, just F -O F -O -R, F-O-R-4, that's it. There's no do while, while, for each. I mean, you could build your own for each if you want. Um, there is something similar to Python's enumerate, um, but it's all using the for uh, keyword. And this is just a simple switch case where like you're given an option to choose a starter um, and that function will be called in main. So as far as actually having an attack in a Pokemon, if you have a struct that was defined previously, you can then fill, I guess, a variable or really a struct um, with that template and actually fill it with data here. 
so here's one of the things I really like about Go, which is pointers. Um, pointers are just like literally just pointing to a memory address of another um, location or variable. Um, so like any variable um, is in a place in memory, um, like the data is there, but it's also, it exists in a address, right? So you can have another variable that stores a pointer to that address. And so anyways, um, if you were to make a map, um, any map in any game, um, each location is like connected to other locations in like a graph kind of way. Um, and so if you first create kind of a template that struct of what a location looks like, it can t has a name of course, um, but then it has connections to other um, locations that it kind of branches off to. Um, that's just an array of, of other locations. It's an array of um, similar uh, structs, right? Because their lo location stores an array of other locations. And so that was like the template when you actually want to fill that data with, um, well, towns and routes and different locations you can just um, call ampersand is address of same in c that little ampersand address of location palette town is at the address of location um, and its name is palette town right and and then you just append um, connections um, to each one of those locations being other locations and then you have the entire game map, which is a collection of all those locations. Uh, so here we just print out every location and its connected locations. Um, it's just a little nested for loop. Um, and then that'll look something like this. As far as the game itself, it's, uh, it's probably like 100 lines of code, if that. Um, and it's just kind of terminal base, you know, select one, two, or three um, as your options, and eh, it's a little fun project, but yeah, definitely play around with Go. Um, I enjoy it. I like the history of languages and stuff like that, especially, but um, if you are sick of, like, Py TypeScript, especially, and, like, very expressive languages and just want something very simple and minimal um, that won't change ever, um, I'd highly recommend Go. So, yeah, thanks for watching.